good evening and welcome to tonight's forum. Thank you for joining us. I'm Cynthia Lewis, Chair and Professor in the Education Department here at UC Santa Cruz, and I will be moderating tonight's University Forum. The UCSC University Forum is an ongoing series focusing on the relevance of our research to the community and to social, economic, environmental, and political issues, proudly featuring the impact of research conducted by the faculty at UC Santa Cruz. Before we begin, I would like to share a few details about the event tonight. We're using a webinar tool, so there's no chat function. We will have an opportunity to answer your questions at the end of the program, and we invite you to submit your questions into the Q&A box at any time. Tonight's event will be recorded. So tonight's UC Santa Cruz University Forum is titled Suddenly Distance, Distant and Still in Flux, the Implications of COVID-19 for K-12 Teachers' Work and Schooling with Professor Laura Bartlett and the Suddenly Distant Research Project team. The COVID-19 pandemic forced the entire teacher workforce into distance teaching essentially overnight. This educational migration has disrupted K-12 schooling and teachers work in unprecedented ways. While early responses focused on getting through a short-term crisis, the longevity of this pandemic is changing the context of teachers work in ways that are affecting the very nature of teachers work and the structure of K-12 schooling. In this for forum, the research project team draws on in-depth interviews with 75 teachers in nine states to explore the ways that state and local responses to the pandemic have reshaped schooling and teachers' working lives, affected teachers' work family lives, and exacerbated, as well as abated, longstanding educational equity issues. Professor Laura Bartlett and the research team members discuss the patterns that have emerged, the implications for the teaching profession and K-12 schooling, and insights into teachers' feelings about how schools can best navigate this crisis. I'm going to very briefly welcome our panelists because we've got a big, very uh, knowledgeable group tonight. And you can look on their website to get um, to find out about all their grants and awards and fellowships. I'm just going to give you the basics. Um, Laura Bartlett is an associate professor of education at UC Santa Cruz. Her research focuses on schools as workplaces for teachers and the reciprocal relationship between educational policy and teachers' orientations to their work. Ellison Thompson, is an, who graduated in 2014 from um, a Cowell graduate 2014, is an assistant professor of education at the Department of Teacher Education at Lewis and Clark Graduate School of Education and Counseling. Her research focuses on the contours of the teacher workforce and the conditions that attract, support, and retain teachers in schools. Dr. Lena Darwich is an assistant professor of education in the Department of Teacher Education at Lewis and Clark Graduate School of Education and Counseling. Her areas of expertise include social and emotional learning as it intersects with social justice and, on, and also focuses on teacher-student relationships. Riley Collins is a PhD student in the Education Department at UC Santa Cruz. Her research interests center on teacher labor organizing, social movement unionism, and shifting conceptions of teacher work during the COVID-19 pandemic. Julia Kopich is president of J. Kopich & Associates, a San Francisco-based education consulting firm. She has served as a policy consultant for numerous state and federal organizations, including the U.S. Department of Education. Her areas of expertise include public sector labor relations and improving teacher effectiveness with an emphasis on teacher evaluation and comp compensation. Dr. Judith Warren Little is Professor Emerita of Education from UC Berkeley. Her research interests center on the organizational and occupational context of teaching with special attention to teachers' collegial relationships and to the context, policies, and practices of teachers' professional development. And now we're going to move um, to the panel and Laura Bartlett is going to start us off. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and getting to share this work. I wanted to start out by just sharing with folks a little bit about where this work came from. Last spring, when COVID-19 suddenly became part of all our lives, I, I was teaching at the university. I was teaching a 300 student undergraduate class 
And I got told like many teachers across the country, just take that class online. And uh, although I taught the class a dozen times, I hadn't the slightest idea how to just take that class online. And uh, suddenly my life became a, a turmoil of trying to learn technology and figure out how I actually do the pedagogical practice online. I, I joked with my family that I was a UFO and unintentional faculty online. You could see me in space trying to find my way, you know, to my Zoom links. At the same time, I had two daughters who were high school seniors, and they were both positioned every day at our dining room table trying to finish out high school online. And I got a, a view into all of their teachers also trying to figure out how to teach this online. And I just, I, I, I was struck, but that there, there was something important here. And I, I reached out to these colleagues who are here tonight, who all studies teachers work, and we began to talk about what was happening. Uh, we noted that there was a lot in the news about COVID in schools, but there was little in the media about teacher experience and teacher voice. We all shared the sense that something needed to be done to capture the experience of teachers and understand, document, amplify teacher voice and analyze teachers' experiences working during COVID-19. We wanted to do this both to include the teacher experience in the picture of pandemic schooling that was emerging, and because it seems likely this might not be the last time our schools are asked to take significant steps in response to a crisis. We wanted to be able to inform what might happen in the future. So we pushed out a call to teachers to participate in a one hour interview. And we asked teachers interested in participating to fill out a brief online intake form. And we pushed out that call via Facebook teacher groups, Twitter, professional groups like the National Writing Project, friends, family, colleagues. We were hoping to recruit 50 teachers. But we were hearing that teachers were overwhelmed and we were worried that it might be difficult to find teachers who could talk to us for an hour by Zoom. Well, we very quickly had 750 teachers from 40 states and the District of Columbia fill out our intake form. It was clear to us that teachers really wanted to share their story. But we now had a little bit of a problem because we had more teachers than we could interview, uh, as ambitious as we are, and we needed to find a way to select from that pool. So we knew that we would learn what was shared across teacher experience, the universals, but we also wanted to capture the variation in that experience. So we decided to select a subset of US states and to interview only teachers from those subset of states. And as you mentioned, we chose nine in the end. Um, to select those states, we used two major but unrelated factors. We used the state level experience of COVID and the state level strength of teacher labor unions. So as we all know in the spring and early summer of 2020, some places were experiencing really large COVID outbreaks like New York City, while other parts of the country, COVID seemed non-existent in daily living. So using Center for Disease Control data, we ranked the states from low to high COVID death rates and selected states that were above, near, and below the median of state level COVID death rates. We use death rates and not, not uh, others because it seemed the least disputable at that point in time. Um, we also wanted to vary the working conditions of teachers and looked at relative teacher labor union strength by state. And we thought that would offer a structural way to select states that offered very different teacher labor union situations. So we charted all 50 states for both relative COVID death rates and teacher labor union strength, and we selected nine. Now remember that these two factors, COVID death rates, and union strength are unrelated. We're not claiming a correlation between the two at all. Um, and the states are ranked in relation to one another, not against an absolute value. But let me show you what this looks like, because it's a little easier to see in a picture uh, than it is uh, from me talking. Here we have the nine states. We have each of the nine states that we ultimately selected because of where they sit on the COVID death rate by union state rankings. The X or horizontal axis is the teacher union strength from low to high. And the Y or the vertical axis is the COVID death rate from low to high as of July. We wanted to sample three strong, they're over here, labor union states three medium labor union states, and three weak down here in the end. And we wanted to sample each of the three to include one state above the median for COVID death, one state at 
or near the median and one state below the median. And so you can see these three clusters. New York over here had very high death rate from COVID and a very strong teachers union. Whereas over here at Texas had a fairly weak teachers union and a, and a relatively low COVID death rate, right? So that's how we ended up with these nine states. Now, once we had the states identified, we invited teachers from the larger pool to participate in interviews. We interviewed 75 teachers between late July and early September. And this included about seven to 10 teachers in each state. We sampled for variation by geography. So we wanted urban, rural, and suburban teachers, and also by grade and subject level. We wanted elementary, middle, and high, as well as we paid attention to teacher demographics and all of this. So here's a quick look at uh, the community and grade level of the 75 teachers. You can see we had about 30% urban, 40% suburban, 25% rural. The grade level, about 33% is elementary, 21% middle school teachers, 45% high school. And as for the gender and race of our teachers, they're pretty close to the national statistics um, for teachers. 76% of our teachers are female. That actually is exactly the national profile of American, of US public school teachers. And 72% of the teachers were white, 25% teachers of color. Nationally, that's 79% white. Um, you can, there's more information on our research design and uh, sample on our project website if people want to know more. Um, but what we're going to talk about tonight arise from these data. The fact that we have the responses to this of the 750 teachers to our big push out survey. We have interviews with these 75 teachers. We also surveyed these 75 teachers in November. And then we did a follow up interview with just 36 of them. So tonight, everything we're going to talk about is really stemming from that sample. Uh, there are three main areas that we would really like to focus in on in our presentational part of tonight. That is first the work of teachers, how the pandemic is shaping the work of teachers, then a bit about the parenting teachers and the experience of teachers with children living at home. And finally, the collective voice of teachers, when and how teachers voice was part of the response and planning. And we definitely have a chunk of information to share, but we're super looking forward to the questions we get tonight because we see this conversation really as an opportunity to hear what others are thinking about and to push our thinking forward. Thanks, Cynthia. Thank you. Um, we're go I'm going to start with uh, um, a few kind of general questions just to get us situated in this study. All of us have some contact with teachers in our lives, but I know that the audience will be eager to hear what you're learning from your larger sample about the teacher perspective. So Judith, if you could start us off, how do teachers characterize what it has been like teaching during the pandemic? Thanks, Cynthia, uh, and, and thanks to the teachers who stepped up for this, um, and especially to those who have spent anywhere from one to three or more hours on Zoom interviews with us. Um, I'll try to give a big picture of what we learned in the spring. You know, we're immersed, all of us, in what's happening now, but a good part of what happened then has relevance now, as I think we'll learn as we go through the webinar. Um, we've been on a 10-month marathon, uh, maybe a slog, we would call it at this point. Uh, but we should recall that there was a massive and sudden change, really ever, overnight in mid-March. And oddly enough, on, for most of the people we talked to on Friday the 13th, mm -hmm. um, it took enormous effort from districts, schools, teachers, students, and parents to respond. And the teachers we talked to were proud of being part of an effort that prioritized student well-being first and foremost at that time. Pretty much everywhere, the messages to teachers from districts and schools fell under an umbrella of what they called and we called do no harm. Um, those messages and the policies that went along with them acknowledged big disparities in all but the most affluent communities in students' ability to access assigned work, to get instructional help, uh, and to remain in contact with their teachers and classmates. Those no harm policies had a broad reach, including an emphasis on review or enrichment rather than new academic content, especially in the first few weeks of the shutdown. Restrictions on grading, no one could fail. Um, no penalties for students who did not complete assigned work or who did not show up on, for online office hours or meetings, and a suspension of state and local uh, standardized testing. 
And even when the restrictions on new content were lifted, um, the other policies like no grading, no failure remained in place. That stance of no harm was really, really widespread, but more specific guidance or requirements for teachers varied widely. This is where it's clear that local context matters. Some guidelines established the number of hours that teachers were expected to be available online or by phone and email each day. Other guidelines focused on specific tasks. For example, one Florida elementary teacher was directed to upload one video, short video per day in each of four subjects, math, language, arts, social studies, and science, and to provide feedback on every assignment. Her example is fairly rare. It's at one end of a continuum. But nearly half of our sample received no specific guidance about what, how, or how much to teach or, or were asked mainly to try to keep students engaged. They had to make judgments about what and how much their students could handle remotely and how they could provide students with support. So we asked teachers to walk us through a workday. What we learned was the traditional workday was upended and stretched out, especially for middle and high school teachers whose students no longer showed up for the 8 a.m. class, but emailed or texted well into the evening with questions. Some of those students did their work in the middle of the night and slept through the morning. Others cared for younger siblings during the day or they went to work. Meanwhile, primary grade teachers had to count on parents uh, to help them connect directly with their students and to engage with any academic work. At every level, teachers worked long hours and went to great effort to stay connected with students. Meanwhile, we heard about a steep learning curve Talk about building a plane while you're flying it. Teachers struggle to transition to the technical aspects of remote teaching, uh, which as we know is continuing. Um, about half of our larger pool of 70, 70, 750 plus teachers and about half of our sample of 75 had little or no prior experience with online platforms and tools. And those who did had used them in combination with in-person teaching. Uh, fewer than 5% reported significant experience with those platforms and tools. So teachers spent large amounts of time finding online resources, planning different kinds of lessons than they would otherwise teach, uh, learning how to use Google Classroom or Canvas or other platforms, and helping students and families do the same. So we hear about kids as digital natives these days, but it turns out they're not when it comes to online learning. Some teachers got transition support from a variety of sources, technology specialists, school librarians, turned out to be heroes in some cases, uh, and from their colleagues. And a few districts were able to offer extensive professional development uh, for technology, for remote teaching strategies, but many did not have the capacity to do that. A few teachers expressed pride in what they'd been able to learn in a short term, <laughs> but they would rather not have had to. Um, teachers also str struggled with sudden disconnect, not being able to see their students, a complete loss of contact with some, uh, unable to teach in the highly interactive ways they normally would. They commonly reported the contacts with students on Zoom or via phone calls, emails, or texts centered around social and emotional connections far more than any academic support. As the weeks went on, it became harder for many to sustain connections, especially with middle and high school students who dropped away. Teachers missed their students. They missed what they considered real teaching. One teacher said, I got really good at exactly the kind of teaching I don't believe in. Through all of this, teachers were largely on their, man on their own to manage the day-to-day -day work of teaching from a distance. Some sought out other teachers for support. It turns out that hundreds of new Facebook, teacher-focused Facebook groups were created in the last two weeks of March. Teachers with strong teacher teams in their school highlighted the support those colleagues provided in every way, technologically, instructionally, and emotionally. Still, most teachers, even those with those close colleagues, reported intense isolation and exhaustion. While what it meant to be a teacher changed Suddenly and substantially, teachers went from an intense dynamic day full of interaction over hours 
to hours at a computer. A California teacher said, I don't want to have a desk job. I love my students. And suddenly my job is about typing things up into a document that I post and then answering emails. When asked what would count as success in the fall, teachers like this one place building new relationships with students front and center. So <laughs> uh, a massive and sudden change that forced everyone to rise to an unprecedented occasion. Last spring, no one expected to still be teaching fully or partly from a distance this year, but here we are, nearly a year later and still in flux, which brings us to the fall. Thank you. Um, I, you know, it, one of the things that stands out to me is that comment, I got good at the kind of teaching I don't believe in. And I think at least at the university level, there's been some changes in, in in instructors' attitudes or experiences of online teaching between last spring and this fall. And I wonder if that has been the case or what the case has been for the teachers' experiences. Laura? Well, Cynthia, you know, in general, last spring, everyone believed the shutdown was transitory. And in a lot of places, all the summer planning presumed a return to schooling as usual, which in some cases short-circuited the ability to plan for a very different kind of fall, right? If we all plan, we're gonna go back just the way we used to be, we're not really planning for the new reality. And that definitely happened um, in many of the places around the country we spoke to. Um, in fact, though, from our fall survey, we know that as of November, only 6% of the teachers in our sample were back to being fully in person. Um, 63%, the vast majority were still remote, fully remote and 31% were working in some sort of hybrid configuration. And I wanna pause around that hybrid configuration thing for a minute because what hybrid actually means is really unclear beyond it indicating some combination of remote and in-person instruction. But within that lies a complexity that the term does not capture. Although we, th we throw it around as if we all agree that we know what it means. Um, some schools offer hybrid programs in the form of what we've come to call parallel tracks of in-person and remote learning, each staffed by and serving different groups of students and, and, and teachers. So you'd have like a group of teachers and students over here and they're remote and another group of teachers and students over here and they're in person and never the twain shall meet. Those are parallel. Other schools um, offer hybrid programs where a teacher teaches students in person and remotely simultaneously at the same time. Uh, sometimes the teachers see all of the students in person at some point. Other times, at least some of the students are fully remote. But in these blended hybrid models, teachers are teaching in more than one modality at one time. Um, and this has been uh, something that we've, a lot of folks have heard of this called AB models. That's what gets bandied about to capture that. According to our data, this blended hybrid model is the most taxing on teachers. And, uh, and according to the teachers we spoke to, it limits their ability to teach and serve students well. For some teachers, their schools have even tried and abandoned the blended model. So when you ask me about how teaching has changed, I would say in many of these places, these teachers are just really trying to manage these two modalities and they really can't get into uh, the, the pedagogical practice as much when they're trying to balance both of these things. And just picture you're trying to zoom in the classroom. I know some of the teachers watching don't need to picture it, they've been doing it. You're trying to keep run the zoom and the technology but you don't have a really strong enough internet s s provider in your classroom to maintain that. So then instead you maybe get some students doing FaceTime with the students who are at home. Um, your camera goes out. It's it's a really uh, never mind the fact that you need really two very different pedagogical approaches for an online class and an in person class. So, I want to tell you that we know that within our sample, this version of hybrid is most often experienced by rural teachers working in states with weak labor unions. So it's an interesting little where we find that. Okay, so. Well, there hasn't been a massive return to pre-academic, pre-pandemic schooling. There has been a return though this fall to curriculum coverage expectations. Um, there's an expectation that uh, students will attend school unlike last spring, uh, that there will be grades. Um, in most cases, state testing has resumed. One Massachusetts teacher shared with us that not only would Massachusetts have its standardized testing this spring, they were attempting to reschedule the ones that they missed last spring sometime this winter so that they could catch up. So 
there's this idea that we have to return back to the structures that we lost. And these expectations exist even in the full-time remote versions of schooling, right? Also, this fall, when there wasn't a return to school as usual, the, the mood shifted in a lot of places from one of, we're all in this together, to tensions and disagreements about the degree of COVID threat and the appropriate form that schooling should take. Teachers who felt celebrated as heroes in the spring told us they began to feel vilified. In the spring, they felt appreciated that parents in particular saw and appreciated the energy that teachers were putting into keeping school going. But this fall, some teachers really feel critiqued by parents in the community. Those that, that were looking to social media with those Facebook groups to figure out their teaching in the spring that Judith mentioned, um, they're now avoiding social media because they don't wanna see the negative things that are being said about them. Uh, as one Texas teacher told us, she said, I've left every single social media group involving anything in this community because of how negative it got. Mm -hmm. It was really, really, really hard to teach kids and watch their parents be so nasty and negative towards teachers that I had to separate completely from that. I have to teach these people's kids. If it's not this year, it'll be next year or the year after. I need to like them. So teachers reported to us that they were working long hours, that they had exhausting days, that they were struggling to engage students who leave their cameras off and don't speak in online classes. They talk about looking at a sea of little black boxes when they're on Zoom with nobody speaking and occasionally they get a comment in the chat box. Uh, and most teachers are still teaching from a distance, even if they're back in person. That was a really interesting thing to us. Even if they're in the classroom with kids, the kinds of safety protocols that have been put in place really keep the teachers far away from the students. In Florida, a English language arts teacher who's currently teaching fully in person described the COVID safety measures her, in her classroom is limiting interaction so much that she feels far away from her students and she has them collaborating online in the classroom because they're required to sit, as we all know, six feet apart, but all facing forward they're not supposed to turn their heads in the class to talk to anyone next to them. They're masked, right? And they are just can't really interact except online. So she's teaching online in the classroom, or as we kind of came to know that over time, it was like on the room in the room on Zoom. Um, so some of that is indeed happening. Uh, I want to tell you though that we see a real paradox in terms of how teachers are feeling about their teaching. Uh, two thirds of the teachers that completed our survey in November said they feel better or even much better about the teaching they're able to do this spring, this fall compared to the spring. They feel much better about the teaching they're able to do. Uh, and nearly the same percentage, 62%, said they feel a diminished sense of success as a teacher. So they feel better about their teaching, but they feel less successful as a teacher. And that's quite a place to be in, really. Among the satisfactions that teachers report are renewed contact with students, a sense that they're actually teaching again this fall, that now that schools and classes have a start and an end time, students are required to attend, grades matter, and the teachers are actually teaching material again and they feel students are learning. A rural science teacher in Texas says, she feels satisfied that I have seen a great deal of growth from August to now in my students' thinking abilities. An urban Texas elementary school teacher says she feels satisfied that I actually feel for the most part that students are learning pretty well during Zoom and are completing their independent work. So they're talking about really feeling like they're actually teaching again and students are truly learning again. But they miss, they really miss that intrinsic satisfaction of seeing a student's eyes light up when they understand something new. They miss the energy of the classroom where students are engaged with one another. And they're really worried, really worried about student engagement. An urban Florida high school social studies teacher shared her concerns about engagement. She said, the most daunting thing for me is student engagement. I spent most of last spring chasing kids, but now that we're synchronous, my students who need the extra motivation and I'm, who I would have been able to engage with in a face-to-face -face environment, now I have to, they, they have a way to skate by by saying they're in class. They're there, but they aren't fully engaged. We hear all kinds of stories. I bet the teachers watching could tell even more of them about students who are supposedly logged on but are actually playing a video game or watching a film or you know not actually there. A lot of them say the class ends, but half the students don't leave when the class ends because they're not there to log out. So the teacher has to manually log them all out. 
So teachers are worried about their well-being and they're conflicted about the balance between meeting safety needs and learning needs. They talk to us about their concern that students are disengaged and they worry that students, what students are missing out on. But the teachers aren't the only ones who are conflicted. Um, an aspect of still in flux pervades schooling and teachers work right now. Right now, as we hold this forum, school boards all over the country are debating what schooling should look like for the rest of the school year. In person, hybrid, remote, synchronously, or asynchronously remote. There isn't even widespread agreement about what factors should be taken into account in making that decision. But there are really strong supporters of each option. The sense of an uncertainty, this uncertainty really pervades. This is what we hear over and over again. It pervades these teachers teaching lives. What they want is predictability. What they have is uncertainty. They want their schools to choose a mode of schooling, but they're afraid that isn't possible to stay in one. They feel that they need to be, as they told us, poised to pivot at any moment. So all of the teachers in our sample would prefer truly to be teaching in a pre-pandemic reality, but given the current realities, what they ask for over and over again is stability and a sustainable model. That's what we hear. And that's, that's what we see happening in the fall, Cynthia. We actually hear that teachers are so caught up in trying to figure out the mode of schooling and navigating the multiple changes of the mode of schooling that they are distracted from being able to focus on the pedagogy of their teaching. Thank you. So it's so complex. Um, I, we all have stories about watching our grandchildren and children and maybe we'll, we'll, we'll get to hear some of those in the question and answer. Um, but we know that this shift from teachers are saviors last spring, oh my gosh, how do they handle, I can't bear to be with my kids all day, you know, kind of thing, to um, that shift from teachers as saviors to teachers as just not working hard enough or, um, you know, why aren't they just back in the classroom, that that, um, that stress then becomes, um, it, it has to do with parenting. And yet some of the teachers, many of the teachers are themselves parents. So I know that you've been studying that as well. And I'd love to hear from um, Allison and Lena. Allison first, what brought you to include a focus on parenting in your study on teaching? And what have you learned from that focus? Thanks, Cynthia. So teaching has a reputation as a family friendly profession. This is mostly due to the fact that there's schedule compatibility, teachers' schedules align up with the schedules of school-age kids. But that notion that teaching is, is family-friendly really requires boundaries between home life and work life. And as you just mentioned, those boundaries were disrupted by the pandemic. So we decided to include a focus on parenting teachers because it gave us a more complete picture of the working lives of teachers during the pandemic. So we've learned a lot, but I only get five minutes. So I'm gonna give you sort of a big picture and then dig into one of the working conditions that parenting teachers talked about as a crucial component of teaching during the spring. And that's the issue of flexibility. So first, the big picture. Parenting teachers were largely on their own in managing childcare responsibilities. Most of them, 81%, had partners or spouses that were also working remotely from home. But the parenting teachers assumed most, sometimes all, of the childcare responsibilities. Less than half of the sample referenced support at home for managing this dual reality of working, of home life and work. Um, another thing that we learned was that this disruption this of work and home boundaries created the conditions for overwork and exhaustion among parenting teachers. 74% of parenting teachers reported overwork and an extended teaching workday. And that's in comparison to only 45% of teachers without children at home reporting an extended workday. So this routine juggling act that working parents typically experience was really intensified by the uncertainty of COVID 
and the massive changes to their teaching work that Judith just described. So all teachers work was disrupted, but for parenting teachers, they were figuring out how to teach second graders on Zoom or trying to connect with their missing 11th graders while they were taking care of their own four-year-old. So one of our teachers summed it up like this. She said, yeah, it was exhausting. I was tired in an entirely different way. Pre-COVID with our contract hours, I could be a mom and go pick up from childcare and all those other things. On a meeting day, my day ended at four. And so now it's spilling over into evening, you know? Things are not ready. That took a huge mental and emotional toll that then became physical. I was tired. I was way more tired than I ever have been because it was just taking over everything. Okay, so how did they manage this dual, these dual responsibilities? I'm gonna talk a little bit about this one working condition that came up a lot. Um, most of the parenting teachers, 84% of them, had the autonomy to flexibly schedule their work days. So teachers shared this um, as long as it gets done ethos from their administrators about teaching in the spring and a general atmosphere of support from their colleagues, many of whom also had children at home. So for example, one middle school teacher shared that on her grade level team, she was one of two teachers with young children. So when they chose their one, so they chose 1 p.m. for their biweekly team meeting because that's when all the toddlers were napping. A high school chemistry teacher in Arizona married to an essential worker, waited until his husband was home from work for most of his teaching tasks. So his work day, his teaching work day was from five to midnight, which turned out to coincide with his student school day. They were mostly logged in and doing their work uh, from five to midnight. What we learned was that this flexibility was really crucial because it enabled parenting teachers to shift from parenting to teaching tasks throughout the day, or in some cases do both simultaneously if that's what they needed to do. An Iowa high school teacher said this, we've got a lot of teachers that have babies, you know, so a lot of people rocking their children while we were having meetings or putting them down for a nap or getting them a bottle while we were planning, you know, putting themselves on mute so they could address somebody yelling in the background or something. I mean, that was really not frowned upon. It was just pretty normal. I mean, my principal has two kids who are younger than my two and his boys were constantly on screen. We all just rolled with it. So there was definitely a, 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 a feeling of being supported in managing the situation. But I don't wanna paint too rosy a picture of this flexibility because while it was necessary and appreciated by the teachers, it also created the conditions for overwork and a very long work day. If you have too much to do and only more time to do it, that's just, it's a recipe for exhaustion. And that's what we heard from our teachers. And also the issue of flexibility came up because it was a temporary arrangement in the spring and everyone knew that it was an emergency response. And no one was expecting that flexibility to continue into this school year. And in fact, in their summer interviews, several parenting teachers were really concerned about the fall and how they would manage. An Oregon elementary teacher con considered taking a leave because she couldn't imagine, she couldn't picture how she was going to make the planned hybrid schedule that her school was considering with two school-aged children of her own and a preschooler. Here's what she said. She said, I was like, oh my gosh, maybe I have to take a leave. How can I do this with three kids? But then it's like, nope, we need my income and we need health insurance. It's not even possible. Now that's when my attention shifted from being really anxious about a month ago and really struggling and lots of emotions and tears and grasping at things I couldn't control into putting energy into communicating with the district demands and needs and communicating with the union because I have to do this and I wanna do it. I didn't wanna be forced to feel like the only choice was a leave. And for a while it felt 
like that was going to have to be. So the crisis of the spring might be over, but the uncertainty facing these parenting teachers is definitely not over. Even now in January, as Laura was talking about, schools are making decisions about how to change things. Um, teachers are facing more uncertainty. Would they be teaching remotely next week? Would they be hybrid? Would their schedules match the schedules of their children? If they are going back to in-person teaching, will they need to put their own children in daycare or in in-person schooling, even if they don't feel entirely safe doing so? And if they need daycare for young children, will it even be available? Um, one third of the parenting teachers in our study have young children at home that were in daycare before the shutdown. And it's estimated that 4 million daycare slots have been permanently lost to the pandemic. So what will this mean for parenting teachers, for working families in general? And I think it's really important that parenting teachers and working families are not the only ones thinking about these things. Workplaces need to be considering this. HR departments need to be considering this. Anyone making decisions about teachers' work need to be thinking about these issues. Thank you, Allison. Um, what you've been talking about with this unpredictability leads me to my next question, which is, um, I'm gonna ask Lena, because I know you've been doing some research in this area, what if any long-term implications do you see for these parenting teachers if we can assume that there will be a time post-pandemic? You're on mute. That always happens. Um, thank you, Cynthia. Professional burnout is the risk. Um, and burnout is something to, con to really be concerned about because it's the leading cause for teachers to leave the profession. And two of the main elements of burnout that we actually have seen in our parenting teachers were emotional exhaustion and a diminished sense of success. Um, and we were, uh, Alison and I were particularly concerned about this because as she just mentioned, 74% of our parenting teachers have reported overwork and um, versus 45% of our non-parenting work uh, teachers. And overwork is one of the strongest, if not the strongest predictor of burnout, of teacher burnout. And in retrospect, this is not surprising because really parenting teachers were fighting um, of, on two fronts in the spring. And some of them are still going through that in the fall. They were facing the daily challenges of teaching remotely, learning a completely different way of teaching. And at the same time, they were trying to take care of their own children and support their own children's distance learning. And most of them were the primary caregivers at that time. To give you an example of the core sign of, of um, emotional ex exhaustion, which is at the core of burnout, what we noticed when we talked to our teachers about how do you feel about teaching in the spring and, and, the, and how it went, some of the things that kept recurring were words like a nightmare, impossible, the hardest months of my life, feeling horrible as a parent. So on top of these feelings, the two that also really emerged were anxiety and guilt, which we know are could lead to um, a diminished sense of success and eventually burnout. And these guilt and anxiety emotions stayed with them for a while. Um, I had, they talked about guilt of feeling that they can't give their ch children enough attention. They're trying to be there for their students, support the students and their families, as we know, because the boundaries have been blended to figure out how they can support the, their students' learning and their families in doing that. And that meant for some of them that their own children's needs were not, there was no time for it. So for example, I had one teacher when it really represents what was going on for teachers uh, with parents. She was the parent of two elementary school children. She said, it's really like, it's really deep guilt that I keep feeling also about my own kids' education. And I was like, well, I mean, I'm a teacher, but I think this semester for them is a complete wash. My children are not doing the things that their well-intentioned teachers have set out. You know, I can't fault the teachers. 
but it's really hard to be doing six things at once and to be super attentive for other people's children and also feel like mine are, they're on YouTube. How did you get on YouTube? We were in the middle of an assignment, you know? My children needed my support and not being able to provide that, that's been sort of an ongoing issue for me. So these dual demands of teaching and parenting really left them with a diminished sense of success and a sense of success is very important to our own well-being, especially to things that matter to us. And for teachers, it's their work and their home and their home life. Um, and um, that was really summed up really by this teacher who talked about not being able to do both. She said, I could be a teacher to my fourth graders, or I could be a parent and maybe sort of a teacher for my kids, but I couldn't do both. So you know, it's almost been a year. We're still, we're still dealing with a pandemic. And as my, uh, my collaborators have said, there's a lot of uncertainty. And the longer this uncertainty, the heavier toll on them. You can't help but wonder, will this lead to more teacher attrition overall? And definitely our, our, our parenting teachers are included in that. Thank you. Um, and with all of this, um, so often teachers don't have a voice um, in, in what happens and how things are going to be arranged. Um, although I assume sometimes they do as well, and I'm eager to hear more about that element of teacher voice in this study. I'm going to start with Riley on that topic. A big part of the research sample was an inclusion of states with different labor union strengths. How do teachers characterize the role that unions have played since the start of the pandemic? Yeah, so first off, in general, the teachers really expressed a profound lack of voice in the planning decisions brought about by COVID. So less than a third of the teachers felt that their input had really been solicited for the fall planning in a meaningful way. Uh, for example, a high school science teacher from Texas said, quote, there was no teacher input. So when we started to hear the plan, it was kind of like, why? What would make you think that was a good idea? But despite this, um, teachers also consistently identified their union as a primary channel for their input. So they talked about how their unions really work to get their feedback on issues like setting work hours, what supports teachers needed, and then advocated on behalf of teachers. And so this finding that unions were a primary for channel, uh, you know, a, a primary uh, channel for teacher input is particularly important given that lack of voice that, that teachers felt. And um, some teachers told us, as Lena was describing, that they really felt that their lack of voice in planning decisions throughout COVID has been a main factor in teachers leaving the profession. So for example, an elementary teacher from Florida said, um, she felt that teachers in her school and, and her district were leaving, not necessarily because of the changes brought about by COVID themselves, but because of how teachers have been perceived in the planning process and excluded from uh, the decisions um, as they've been made. And so within that context, unions have really played a critical role as a channel for teacher voice. And Riley, did you see any variation in teacher union strength? I, I, at the state level variation in teacher union strength that you made sure that you had in the study, did you see any um, effects on teacher decision-making? Yeah, we did. So <clears throat> when we analyzed the teacher's responses about the degree of input that they felt they had in the fall planning decisions, uh, we found that teachers in stronger labor states reported having more input in the fall planning decisions than teachers in weaker labor states. Um, and I'd like to share a table to give a better picture of this. So you can see that um, in the strong labor states, 44% uh, of teachers reported that their input was solicited. And in the weak labor states, only 14% of teachers reported that their input was solicited. 
Um, and there were some surprises in this. So for example, um, Iowa is considered to be kind of medium in labor strength. So the state requires collective bargaining and about 75% of teachers are union members. Um, but none of the seven teachers from Iowa, Iowa that we spoke to felt that their input had really been solicited in the fall planning process. Um, and they largely expressed frustration with mandates from the state. Um, so in the fall, the governor had mandated that at least 50% of classes be held in person as one example. And two of, uh, of those teachers from Iowa have since quit because of their concerns with, with safety um, throughout COVID. And Iowa teachers also had the highest degree of self-reported cynicism in our fall survey across the states. And so the relationship between um, the state's labor strength and teachers' perceptions of their input um, was not found in every case. But in general, um, the finding is important because it suggests that in places with stronger teacher unions that teachers were more likely to feel consulted and feel that they had a voice in the planning decisions. Thank you. Um, Julia, um, California, of course, is considered to have a stronger teacher union. And I know that you've done some research looking very closely at California. Can you give us a closer look at what this voice process looks like in a strong labor union state? Sure, Cynthia, thanks. I can give you a very preliminary um, look because these are data that are still emerging, but it's a California specific um, study and the findings parallel many of the findings that um, Suddenly Distant has and it, uh, kind of amplify what Riley was talking about. So California is a strong union state by any measure um, and teacher voice on district wide policies, particularly around teachers work conditions are exercised generally through their unions and through labor management uh, negotiations. So we found in California, uh, now these data were collected in August and September, so they're not exactly up to the minute, but the pandemic is such a moving target that up to the minute is nearly impossible to achieve. What we found in um, our work is that uh, districts and unions have negotiated since the pandemic, at least two kinds of labor management agreements. One is, was around school closing. I have 12 districts in my sample. All of them closed March 16th. They didn't choose Friday the 13th for some reason, but all of them closed March 16th. Uh, and they were then, the districts and unions were then faced, what do we do in the blink of an eye we're going from uh, in-person learning to remote. And so they developed agreements around what the rest of the spring semester would look like. And the second kind of agreement that they have um, that I think is still evolving because the situation in California is still evolving is what's loosely called school reopening agreements. And these were agreements that included distance learning, in-person learning, a combination of the two, but they were generally designed to sketch out what the 2021 school year would look like. And all of the union leaders and superintendents says, said, these are our best guesses. We have no idea what's going to be happening. A number of the teacher union locals that uh, were in my sample sent surveys to their members um, as they developed these agreements. And they asked two principal questions. One is, what do you need? What kind of support do you need for some kind of continuity of instruction? And so that you're able to serve what is almost everywhere a very diverse student body. The second question they asked is, what will it take? Uh, in other words, under what circumstances and conditions uh, will we be able to return to in-person instruction? As you might imagine, those responses were all over the map. That being said, that we have also found that in districts where schools are responsible for establishing some school programs or setting the guidelines, teachers find that their voice find their voice through vehicles like uh, school-based committees and other things like that. Great, thank you. Um, 
Boy, so much has been shared and the um, and we have many, many questions from the audience. So I want to turn now to some of those questions. Um, one that resonates for me right away that I'll start with is um, a question from Melanie. Is there any data about income of the schools and teachers' feelings of success? And what models are used by schools in low income versus higher income? And I think that would um, probably be Laura. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I have to first say that we'll have more information on that. This is like the researcher, you know, Provisio all the time. We haven't yet published in that area, but um, we we are seeing uh, differences in the socioeconomics of schools, right? We um, and as I said earlier, we're seeing as much difference, I would say, between rural and urban schools as we are between high and low income. Uh, one image I have to share with you, you know, because we all know about the difficulty with internet access and technology access. And those of you who don't know need to know that in Texas, um, many school districts turned school buses into mobile internet hubs and they drove them into neighborhoods, low income neighborhoods where there was no internet so that the apartment buildings nearby or into the Walmart parking lot so people could come and park their cars around them for internet. So we know that there've been a lot of innovative um, kind of approaches to things. But we also know when we interview the teachers that the difference is also between the um, the kind of uh, general ed classes and the more advanced classes. So our teachers who taught the AP classes, um, they talk about there not being that much change in the way they teach or in the student engagement around it, but the students in their general classes or the remedial classes not getting the same kind of pedagogical practice. I'd like to invite one of my other colleagues to comment on this. Um, just quickly put your hand up if someone wants to chime in so I know who it is. Uh, come on, Judith, you know you have something to say. Yeah, well, there, I mean, in addition to the question that Melanie asked, there's a question um, from Benjamin James um, about the less interactive, the kind of teaching I don't believe in that comment, and being curious as to other specific pedagogical or planning shifts that teachers reported. And that relates to what you were just saying, Laura. I mean, on the one hand, um, where we saw teachers say that they were able to keep their kids more engaged tended to be in honors classes or AP at the high school level or in schools, particularly secondary schools with strong, what are called advisory systems where teachers had really strong relationships with, with kids and families before this all happened. Um, but for the most part, people had to shift the kind of assignments that they made. You can't do science labs easily online. You can show a video of a, you know, demonstration of a phenomenon, but you can't engage kids in the same way. Um, teachers found that even though Zoom has a, for example, a, a breakout room feature, <laughs> you, you can't use small groups the same way on Zoom. Um, so people who relied in their um, teaching of subject matter on kids really doing sense-making um, a lot of student discourse on um, activities that engage students together around something about reasoning now turned into individual assignments, uh, direct instruction. So I'm actually curious as we continue to learn about how teachers are teaching through 2021 with this mix of still remote and, and hybrid, how people are managing the kind of to create the kinds of lessons and experiences for kids that we you know really enable student learning um, and motivate student learning. So um, yeah, I'm as curious as Benjamin is about how, you know, how this is all unfolding. Thank you. Micah has a, has a, a question I think a lot of people will have in their minds. Were there any evident differences in teacher experience across grade levels? And I'm, I'm sorry, Laura, I'm not sure who would be best to answer that one. Yeah, no, it's true that we did look at uh, years teaching, but uh, again, <laughs> we haven't done the full analysis of the relationship between their years teaching and yeah. the way that they've experienced it. It's um, a good question, Laura. Yeah. 
It's about, about, about across grade, grade levels. level. It's a grade level difference question. Yeah. Grade levels. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference across, so tell me again, is there a difference across grade levels? In what teachers experienced? Oh, yes. 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 <laughs> Big. Uh, Allison, can you talk a little bit about elementary school for us first? Sure. Um, so elementary school teachers were trying to, you know, support five and six and seven year olds in remote education. You know, they were, they talked about have never having, they didn't have necessarily Google classrooms and the type of technologies that our high school teachers and students were familiar with. And so the shift to um, remote education, especially in the spring was, um, was really uh, startling for them. Um, they talked a lot about struggling to get become proficient in technology and also needing to coach families. So we had parents that were, you know, really needing to support their young children in accessing instruction via technology like Zoom or Google Classroom. And so teachers reported being, you know, working in, during the day and then at night they're coaching families on how to click on this and how to click on that. I had one teacher in Arizona say that she created a different account so that she could log in as a parent because she wasn't seeing what they were seeing so she could coach them through how best to support um, their young children. So I think if we looked at um, grade level differences, the biggest um, the most the biggest differences would be between upper elementary or middle and high school definitely and lower elementary and the struggle with um, how to instruct in technology. Um, I, I want to say one thing about this. I have two teachers that we talked to in the fall. So now we're talking about the fall. Uh, one teaches fourth grade in Oregon and one teaches kindergarten in um, Kentucky. They're entirely remote and both teachers for different reasons have chosen um, at the school level and at the grade level for these two different teachers to be logged in from the beginning of the school day till the end of the school day. And they made that choice because they wanted families, the message they gave to families was just log them in, get them in at 8.30 and we'll keep them there. So the kids aren't on screens the whole time but they are, um, so they'll turn their screens off and go do independent reading or something else. But I thought it was an interesting um, juxtaposition from this scramble to become, uh, to use technology in the spring to um, using it almost entirely through the day in the fall in, in both in um, elementary classrooms. Thank you. Yeah, I'm seeing that I have a kindergartner grandchild and a first grader grandchild. The kindergartner's in a rural district where they're doing hybrid, low income rural district in another state where they're doing hybrid. So the teacher's trying to teach kindergartners who can't be in centers, who are in the class, you know, masked six feet apart, no centers, of course, because they can't really do that. Um, and it's working much better with the first grader who's online all day with a great instructor. So I wouldn't have expected that necessarily, but that's really what I'm seeing. Um, I see a question about class size. Can anybody speak to um, the uh, whether class size makes a difference in teachers' experiences? Some, uh, some teachers are asking us what class size means these days. One teacher, I asked her how many classes she was teaching, and she said, I'm, I'm not sure because the, the what that constitutes a class has become a little blurred. You know, that there's a, a, I have students that check in with me. I think these are all considered in one class. So the, a lot of the kind of traditional structures of schooling have been really disrupted. And there are places where there's still very clearly what's a class. And there's other places where the teacher feels like they're in the center of a spider and they have, a, you know, X number of students that they're responsible for. And it's almost like a series of independent studies, particularly if a lot of their lessons are asynchronous and they're close to putting them up. That being said, um, we do have some examples of ways that schools have managed to create smaller units for teachers, um, in particular, an elementary school teacher in Massachusetts who um, her school has a parallel hybrid so that she is teaching um, in person with this with smaller groups of students a few days a week with each group 
and those are now smaller classes. But when the students aren't with her, they're with their specialist teachers online. So she only has them in person in these very small groups and she's not responsible for them when they're not with her. So her overall workload has been diminished and she's one of the only teachers that we had working in a kind of AB hybrid who actually reported high levels of satisfaction and some degree of success because she actually wasn't as stretched thin as the other teachers. Now we don't have a lot of teachers who've experienced a, a diminishment in the number of students they're responsible for. We do have teachers who have fewer students that they're teaching because they've disappeared, but that's a different thing. Um, but there is some indication that those teachers who have fewer students are more able to take care of them and teach them in these new models. Thank you. Can anyone talk about um, either teachers who are um, English language teachers focus on English language students or um, or special ed also, there were questions about those two areas and how teachers are experiencing online um, remote instruction when they're working with these groups of students who may need more support. This might um, be part of a larger question about the equity worries mm -hmm. that teachers expressed. Mm -hmm. um, we do have special education teachers in our sample. I don't have the numbers at my fingertips, but um, and we should put that demographic in the next report. Um, but teachers worried greatly about being able to support um, students with special needs and students who were English language learners and feeling that um, uh, this really needs, needed to be a high priority. Um, in one case, uh, a teacher talked about being actually forbidden to contact, they weren't able to be in one-to-one -one contact with any special education student. They're worried about whatever liability issues, so they, they were delayed in their ability to, to be in contact with their students. Um, one teacher who was generally a um, push-in teacher would come and support the classroom teacher uh, during academic instruction, found her, herself on the one hand trying to be in all of these class, online classrooms throughout the day and backed off to just doing specialized one-on-one -on -one support for students. So people made different accommodations as they were able to. One of the, um, the restriction on new academic content in Iowa uh, teachers interpreted as um, a response to the worries about special education, special needs students, that they were not going to be able, if some people got new content and others didn't, that they were going to be even less able to meet the requirements of, of IEPs, the Individualized Education Plans, um, other both federal and state requirements for special needs. So it became really complicated, I think, for the teachers, another category of teacher, there's a teacher in Oregon we interviewed who is in a school that mostly educates my, the children of migrant workers. And those students, those parents were still out in the field trying to maintain contact with those students was, and serve them well was very different, difficult. It was a, a big worry. So, um, you know, there, I think there was a one thing we really haven't highlighted yet is the pervasive concern that teachers expressed about this exacerbating existing inequities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do want to share a story about one special ed teacher from Massachusetts, and, I, and she was a preschool special ed teacher. Mm -hmm. And I first of all want to say that she felt in her, she, she said she and her colleagues felt like they had been um, kind of overlooked, that when the safety uh, guidelines were being put out and they suggested you stay six feet away from children, they were forgetting that they had to change these children's diapers and you can't do that from six feet away, right? So there is a whole set of challenge that is that the public preschool teachers and particularly the special ed ones had to deal with. That being said, this teacher said that she had an, a couple of examples and one in particular I'll share of real strength that came out of the remote learning in that uh, for the first time she had the most, the greatest amount of parental participation 
in the, because the parents were there with the students and the teacher was online with them and that she had one boy in particular who hadn't been making any progress in school, just blossom, right? He just was outside of where the dynamics that were just difficult for him with classmates and being there with his mother and online with her as the teacher in these much smaller segments that they saw him make enormous developmental gains. I don't know, you know, I don't know how much that mother was happy to be home all the time when she, you know, during a pandemic. And I also don't know how sustainable a model that is, but we absolutely heard stories of beautiful moments of learning that were still happening during in this in this structure and in this framework. I don't imagine that IEPs were canceled with grades last spring, right? So those teachers were still still dealing with the, the same kinds of No, they were often um, doing the the reporting on them was often delayed. Okay. Yeah. And I, um, I'll, I'll add something too, is we had some parenting teachers in our sample who had children with IEPs. And so when we talked to them about some of their challenges, uh, they were talking about this net of support systems that they were used to in schools that they no longer had access to. So I think that it really made me think about the demands on parents with children with special needs in particular um, and the amount of services that are provided through schooling that were, you know, no longer being provided or being provided differently. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think this is a question for Riley or Julia. On the subject of burnout and attrition, has there been follow-up, or Lena, I'm not sure, has there been follow-up conversation with interviewees, um, like updates on how they're doing now almost a year in? Uh, I, I, I think I can speak for the fall survey because we're still analyzing the, um, we still haven't even started to analyze the uh, December survey, but uh, sorry, the interviews. But from the fall, I can give you, because we sent out the survey in the fall to teachers and some of the questions that we asked were about their sense of, like diminished sense of success and um, their, their sense of capacity to care for others. And I'll give you some of the numbers to kind of give you an idea that things could be better. So for example, when we asked teachers to report about the, we had a list of challenges for them in the survey and we asked them to check all the ones that apply. So 74% of our teachers, and that's 73 out of our, 73 out of 75 of our teachers um, responded to the survey. And 74% of them have said reported overwork. Uh, a diminished sense of success, 61% of them reported that in terms of increased cynicism about education, 51% of them felt that. And then in terms of um, a diminished capacity to support others, around 43%. So that's where we are at the moment. We'll definitely get more information once we start looking into our, um, our interviews with our focal teachers. Thank you. I think this one might be you too, Lena. There was a question about mental health support. We've heard from a lot of students and parents about high stress levels and need for mental health support. We've heard them um, describe digital learning like a freight train that doesn't stop. Do you know any examples of approaches, programs, districts, or educators who have found a promising way to address student stress and mental health during COVID? That, that's a really good question. So most of the teachers I spoke to, and again, we we have to go back to the data. They didn't give the specific program that they were talking about. It was mostly about things and efforts that they were doing. Um, things that are like checking on the families, uh, working closely with the counselors, having one of the things that really stands out in mind, and it, it's a few teachers who have talked about it. They found a lot of the time that students were more likely to show up on days where they had to connect. So there were some schools where they had like fun Fridays um, or, or a class for them to get together. They were more likely to show up to these classes than to their office hours for their academics. So it was a lot of these efforts. But if, if the person is interested in this, I do know MindUp is one program to look into and it's about mindfulness. And I know, I remember one teacher, one, a focal teacher I interviewed in the fall, she talked about that they started some mindfulness because efforts in their elementary school classes, because they were not noticing that even, I think she teaches fourth or third graders. She was teaching third graders and she was noticing like levels of stress getting higher for them. 
Um, so I, I don't think they were using a, a particular program, but mindfulness was something that they were talking about. I have, I moved from Canada. And so I still go back to my Canadian websites. Um, there is, I do know that there's teenmentalhealth.org, which is a secondary for secondaries, but they just launched an elementary one and I'll send the link for the person um, later. Great, thank you. Um, I think this, Riley, this one might be for you, but if it's not, just, just let me know or tell me who it would be better for. Um, are there implications of the pandemic-driven changes for after we are finally past the pandemic? Will we return to how things were, or will there be lasting changes in teachers' roles, expectations, pedagogy tools, et cetera? Sure. Um, I think that <clears throat> on the one hand, um, Teachers really expressed concern that um, that technology would be replacing in-person education in the long run. So they were clear that while currently um, they they prefer uh, some of them prefer remote um, learning for safety concerns, that they really don't see technology as this cure-all in in education, and they're concerned about that extended embrace. Um, but on the other hand. Um, when we asked teachers about what they would like to potentially bring with them in, in post-pandemic teaching, I think the, the vast majority um, talked about prioritizing relationships with students and how it has become so evident in, um, in the context right now of just how important that is and that they uh, recognize that that is not necessarily something that is specific only to the COVID context. Great. We're going to take one well, one more question and then move to the um, to like finish this, up. I yeah. want to talk about on that, Cynthia, if that's okay. Sure. There's one other um, really big thing that came up, and that is, um, will will anyone ever be able to be absent in the same way they used to be from school? Right, and uh, because uh, in, we know in Kentucky that for a long time had this thing called non-traditional instruction NTI. So if there's a snow day, which I didn't know Kentucky had snow days, but I guess they do. If there's a snow day, then the students are told just to go out and start doing their NTI so they're not actually absent. And in Florida, we talked to a teacher who is mostly in person, but she has at any given time because of the quarantining rules, 20 students quarantining. And those students are not considered absent. They're considered on school business as if they were on a school trip. And it's each teacher's job to figure out a way to patch those students into the class and keep them attending. Um, we also have heard stories of teachers having to quarantine or even getting sick and being asked to still teach from home with a substitute just keeping order in the classroom. So I don't know the answer to it, but it feels to me like if it's maybe changed anything, it's going to very much change this definition of what it means to be present and what it means to be absent. Yeah, that seems really important when we talk about teacher work conditions. Thank you. Um, Tracy asks, this is really interesting. Was there any evidence of unemployed former teachers returning to the profession? I myself have been out of the classroom for 20 years and I returned during the pandemic because my previous marketing career disappeared. So in part, maybe because other careers disappeared and in part, maybe because online makes it a little bit more flexible, not exactly flexible, but where, where you are at least is more flexible. I think that uh, that's not something we're really positioned to speak to because we recruited 75 teachers, the criteria of which is they had to have been teaching, oh. right? So everybody in our sample was teaching last year they're not all teaching this year and some of them would like to leave teaching but don't feel like they can because of the labor market situation but um we don't we don't really know about who might be coming in though clearly one person has <laughs> thank you um we have about 10 minutes left and laura i know that you wanted to um finish up with a few um closing comments and then i have a few comments about the next um forum and that kind of thing. Great, I just am gonna quickly share with you all. I've, I've noticed there's lots of comments in the chat box about where can folks learn more about the work, et cetera. And um, I just wanted to share with you all, if you haven't seen in the chat box, that this is our website, our project website. Um, and we publish uh, uh, all of our work and news of what we're doing there, but we also put articles that are related to this topic 
Um, we have released uh, one report in November called Suddenly Distant Teachers Work During COVID-19 in Spring 2020. That's on our website and downloadable right now. We have a second report that will drop, as they say, I think, in the marketing business on Friday uh, that is named the same as tonight's talk. And that is really about suddenly distant and still in flux. And it looks much more about teachers' work anticipating the fall and actually working in the fall. Um, and in early February, we are going to release a report, a kind of white paper on the many forms of hybrid models that goes into much more detail about the kind of stuff that I referenced here and details this, um, if you will, this uh, parallel, I'll just show you very quickly, this, um, the types of hybrid models is a little, a little preview of our next re our report on that. We're going to be looking at the parallel models of uh, hybrid, the alternating models, that AV model, and the blended models that bring uh, both students and teachers and in person and remote together in the same classroom. So that will be in our report on hybrid and more. Um, and this is where everyone can find it. So I'm going to stop sharing, but I think that that address will get tweet, uh, chatted out again to you all if you need it. Can I ask a question? Um, did have you did you have you noticed any differences in experiences between teachers of color and teachers who identify as white? Allison, would you like to tackle that? Um, well, we were doing our summer interviews at a time of racial, um, you know, upheaval the protests for George Floyd's murder. And so we did hear from some of our teachers of color that they were dealing, you know, when we're talking about teaching remotely and we had questions for them that they were really also engaged in um, anti-racist teaching work and things like that. And, I, and it came up more um, among our teachers of color, not entirely. Lena, do you wanna add anything? I, I think, it came up, I, I, I remember one interview in particular, it was a teacher in, of color in Oregon, where, yeah, there was a lot, it, some uneasiness about, about not talking about, about these mm -hmm. things enough um, while thinking about what COVID, like they, they, that was one of their concerns. But I think overall, most, like there were several teachers who were, who identify as white and talked about it as well, um, as Allison said. Okay. And one thing that I'm thinking of also is that for teachers of color that were working in schools that serve predominantly vulnerable communities, I'm thinking of a teacher that we talked to in um, rural Oregon, um, was just a high degree of concern about COVID rates in vulnerable communities, and um, mm -hmm. and that and that came up in her in her interview as well, as well as just um, issues around racial justice and teaching for racial justice and what that meant mm -hmm. um, to be happening during the pandemic. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, those equity issues really loom large. Um, uh, I've been asked to ask this question, can we share the website on social media? Not any screenshots of the presenters, just the website link. Definitely. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, great. Um, all right, then I am going to um, thank you all for joining us tonight um, and ask you to join us on February 4th for our next, uni uh, for our next university forum, Isolation, Anxiety, and Stress, which will be with Professor Psychology Craig Heaney and UCSC alumna UC Irvine professor, Ellison Holman. And with that, I'd like to thank our wonderful presenters. Um, this work is so interesting and I'm glad that we can, um, that we know about it in its, at its start and we can follow it as it develops and as you analyze more of the data. This has been really very um, insightful and, and, and really interesting. And I, as I know the audience agrees, and maybe I should end with, oh, I wish I could find this, but I probably won't be able to find it right now. There was a wonderful um, comment from Lori, 
saying, this is the example, um, Julie, I think, I'm sorry, saying, I still haven't found it, but I, I, I'll tell you what it said. It said that um, I have exactly what she's experiencing as a teacher. Do you have it? Yep, she you said, did? listen to yeah. this, you feel heard, and I feel seen, particularly knowing that my feelings about direct learning are fairly universal, distance learning, sorry. This helps me feel less isolated and unsure. How do I share your research with my colleagues and the district? And the answer to that is you can share this webinar and you can also share the reports from our website. Um, it's really been a privilege getting to talk to you all and share work when it's when it's emergent. You know, we, we made a commitment when we started this project to the teachers that we would do our best to get the work out while it was still relevant and not wait, you know, for all the peer reviewed journals. So uh, thank you for helping us yeah. do that. This. Yeah, that's that's great to have um, teachers able to share this with their colleagues and with administrators in their district seems really important and right on point with the subject of teacher voice. That was one of the focuses. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cynthia. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.